Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Nice to have you. Please, all quiet, please. Thank you. Go ahead and have your notes out. Uh, your, your computer's to the screen that has the notes on it. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, we're going to be continuing looking at World War I. Um, we're getting closer to actually wrapping this up. And so there you go, right up on the board. We have, uh, Danton, we have a date for your test on this World War I unit, which is going to be Friday when you get back. Okay? So we'll see you today. We'll see you this Friday. We'll not see you for two weeks. I'll be reading your papers. Okay? And you're going to be leaving those alone for a while, <laughs> hopefully. Because um, you don't want to necessarily work on them over break unless you haven't done it, which is, yeah, you don't want to, you don't want to go there. Um, and then when you get back on the Monday, um, you're not going to be actually physically in school. I would say review. I'll have some stuff there to, uh, like, you know, some, there's a lot of different review videos, but mostly just, like, hunker down into your notes. Um, if we need to pick up anything to finish out on the 6th when you get back that Wednesday, we will. Otherwise, that day will be dedicated to review for the test. 80 points. Lots of matching and true-false. Yes. Yeah, look to each class, and I'm still figuring it out as far as like how that's going to work. Um, you, you come in, juniors will come in on the day that they're supposed to. Blue day, always Tuesdays and Thursdays. Green group, always Wednesdays and Fridays. Okay, that's my understanding, and then it'll be up to the particular teachers as, as far as what you're going to be doing. I guess the idea is that. It gives teachers more time to prep and grade and so forth. I'm not looking forward to having less time with you in class because I actually like to have that with the face-to-face -face instruction kind of thingy and so forth. Um, as it is, we're still in good shape. I know sometimes, you know, I told you guys, uh, we're not going to do the Mexican Revolution unit, so we're going to put that off if we can ever get to it. And then you're like, oh my gosh, is that going to set us behind as far as getting ready for the IB test in May? No, that year that I took off, um, when I came back, the seniors, who I obviously didn't have as juniors, they only got through half of the stuff that they needed to during that year. And I was able to get them ready, and they were in good shape. So my goal is to always give you a lot of material, a lot of stuff, so that you have more choices. When you get to the IB exam in May, you look at a whole bunch of different questions, and you're like, I think we covered that pretty well, but I don't like the way they asked that question, so I'm not going to do that one. Uh, I'll do that one, and that one, and that one. So you'll be able to pick the ones that you'll do best. And actually, three units, three IB history units, you already did in the ninth grade. So yeah, so I mean, if they have a really good Civil War question or two really good Civil War questions, you're like, oh, I'm going to hone in on that. I got the notes and I reviewed those, so it's fresh, like my freshman year. Then you can pick those questions. So anyway, so we're in, we're in good shape. Uh, keep, keep posted on that. I don't, I'm really leaning against like trying to set up Zoom sessions, honestly, for the, like the Mondays and things like that, or record Zoom sessions. Um, yeah, I mean, it's weird because I remember having conversations before the whole like massive online and everything and thinking, you know, wow, the wave of the future, online education. I'm like, I just somehow feel like face-to-face -face is going to be better and I'm actually even more convinced of that. Um, and so if you guys are going to be coming to school physically and so forth, I'll be here and that's kind of what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to resist the temptation to like record stuff and then <laughs> say, watch it. If you have to watch it because you're quarantined, you have to. If you have to watch it because you're like set up at home and so forth, you can't. But I don't know. I mean, what would you say? Some of you guys who this semester have been at home and in school, what do you prefer? Yeah, that's what I figured. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's a hard, it's a harder challenge. I mean, my daughter is a really good student, but she was doing some online classes uh, when she was your age. It was really hard to just like because it's like, where's your, ho where's your office? Your bedroom. Where's your classroom? Your bedroom. Where's the place you chill out? Your bedroom. <laughs> I mean, it's like, everything is that room. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah. I don't do I don't do schoolwork and so forth. Yeah, I'm just like that's chill out place. So anyway, here's a little quick update for you guys. Um, and we've got those. They've got these plugged into uh, Google Classroom. Uh, excuse me, PowerSchool, whatever it is that we put the grades in. Um, you guys had an opportunity to make election predictions, and as of Monday, we actually have the election. And you're like, what? I thought we had the election back in November. In November, the voters voted for electors. The electors were chosen. The states were certifying the votes. Any uh, challenges to the validity, you know, whether there's existence of fraud and so forth, that was to be worked out. It's nice that we had like a whole month to get those challenges through the court system. Um, those challenges, not surprisingly, were put primarily forth by the Trump campaign. Okay, and so all of those were resolved. And at the end of it, at the end of the day, after the Electoral College uh, voted on Monday, it was 306 electoral votes for uh, Joe Biden. So he is the president-elect, and Congress has to uh, certify that when, oh, I don't know, like when those results come in. <laughs> it's kind of like Christmas morning if you've been looking through your parents' closets to find out exactly what you're going to get. Oh, wow, look, <laughs> this is what I got. So in January, Congress will go, oh, wow, <laughs> Biden and Harris. When is the inauguration, the official inauguration? Yeah. January 20th, okay, and that's in Washington, D.C., and it'll be interesting because we got the whole quarantine and social distancing and so forth. Traditionally, if there is a president who's leaving office, that president is, is there for the um, inauguration, the swearing in of the next president. So like when Trump was sworn in, Obama was there. When Obama was sworn in the first time, Bush was there. When Bush was sworn in the first time, Clinton was there. It was kind of awkward when Clinton was sworn in the first time because he just beat George H.W. Bush in that 1992 election. But George H.W. Bush was there for that. It'll be interesting to see. I've heard some uh, speculation that maybe Trump will not actually physically be at the inauguration. I know there's not going to be as many people at the inauguration, just for social distancing and so forth. But either way, um, <laughs> I was at one inauguration. Ronald Reagan, the very first one, January 20th, 1981. It was a very cold day. On the same day that Ronald Reagan was sworn in, the hostages were released from Iran. You're like, what? <laughs> what? Iran held, yeah, U.S. Embassy personnel. What? A country held U.S. Embassy personnel hostage? That's messed up. Yeah, anyway, that's like, you know, the way things were. But anyway, it was a very memorable thing. I was in high school. As a, as a former member of Congress, my dad was able to get two spots, like, out, you know. I wasn't right up there next to Ronnie. I was way out there with my mom. Sometimes I, I should, I've actually got an image I showed to the 12th graders. I'm like, there, can you see me? Like, way up there. It's like, speck. Um, but, yeah, my dad couldn't go, so I went with my mom. It was really cool. It was a lot of fun um, to do that. And um, so, anyway, January 20th, check that out. I'm trying to think, is that a school day? That's, that's a school day. That's during finals. <laughs> We're actually here on that day. Yay, Martin Luther King Jr., you've got the Monday off, so, and then Wednesday, we'll see you guys on the 20th. We'll be into our next unit by that point. So, yeah, anyway, so check that out. Um, but anyway, some of you guys picked up some points because you were making accurate predictions. I knew you guys would if you just looked at it. You would figure out most of these, uh, you guys, in the, the ones that actually turn them in um, in this class, I think there might have been a couple that maybe did it online, in which case then I eyeballed it and put the grade, figured out here. But it's like one, two, three, four, only four wrong. Um, Nebraska is really hard to get that, uh, you know, second district that went for Biden as opposed to Trump. And then Maine's second congressional district went to Trump instead of Biden. Um, otherwise, this person got those two ones wrong. And Pennsylvania, no surprise there, Georgia, but only four wrong. So well done, uh, Jeremiah. Yeah, yeah, there we go. So you got six, six extra credit points. You're like, ooh, nice. <laughs> it's nice to have a little cushion in there, you know, going into the 100-point <coughs> IA score and the 80-point test. Uh, this person only got Florida and Maine's second congressional district in North Carolina, so you picked up seven points. Way to go, Tessa. Woo, seven points. Woo-hoo. Uh, this person only got Georgia, North Carolina, and Maine's second congressional district. Uh, so dancing, way to go. You picked up uh, seven points. Okay. Okay, this person only got wrong the Florida one and Maine's second congressional district and got everything else accurate. So way to go, Sammy. Right. Okay, eight points. <laughs> Woo! And this person only got the Georgia one. I would have gotten that one wrong too. Yeah, I was like, hello. 
Yeah, I mean, that was a surprise. And then the North Carolina uh, won and picked up eight points. So way to go, Haley. Woo-woo! So as far as, like, overall, would you like to know? It was a senior that only got one wrong. Just the Georgia one. Okay? That was... No guesses? Jack. Okay, Jack Nichols got that. And there was a junior that got them all right. Really? Yes. A junior that got them all right. I'm like, did the research and was just, I don't know, you got to be a little lucky or something on this. You got to just like, I don't know, hang out with this person if you're ever like, you know, at the racetracks or, you know, like whatever. Um, Cadence got them all. So she got a perfect one. I mean, that was like, whoa. And I asked her, she's like, do you, did you know you got a perfect one? She's like, no, I wasn't aware. <laughs> I mean, she wasn't keeping, keeping score at home, but yeah. So yeah, we got that figured out, and yeah, so well done. Um, other extra credit kind of things. Yeah, I would say just get ready for the test. Make sure you do a great uh, job on the IA. Let's go ahead and do the pledge, and then we'll get this. Okay. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you. All right, and let me just make sure I write this in before I forget. Um, they're sending announcements to us, so I'm giving you, although I don't think there's anything really new here, I don't know of anyone in the high school that you're aware of, any of the teachers are doing that. It seems like more of a middle school, sixth grade thing with eggnog. Yeah, Secret Santa. And I uh, was asked, and I've sent that out to everybody, so if you want to participate in that. And I saw the students uh, getting the uh, candy canes ready and so forth. It's... What's that? The, oh, she's doing one. Oh, okay. So put money in hers because it's a good cause. Yeah. Yeah. She's, yeah. I don't know. I like eggnog. I always like half and half, like milk and eggnog and stuff. I like to drink and not wear it. So anyway, yeah. Wow. Just get that creamy, milky, eggy, noggy thing. I've never had <laughs> yeah. I have when I'm like, at the end of the day, I sit back and I'm like, <sighs> it's a little thick. That's why I, I, I <laughs> yeah. Oh, he's very, he's a big fan. Well, anyway, maybe we should, maybe we should have a cup for you. You can like drink it and wear it. Yeah. There we go. We should do it for the students. I think we might raise more money. Anyway, so PJs next time. You guys wearing PJs to school next time? Okay. Candy Graham, those will be delivered uh, Friday, uh, for you guys Friday during six period. Okay, <laughs> no high school students still signed up for a snow team, so anyway. But the slopes are there, enjoy them. Okay, any other announcements? And I think basketball, girls basketball is coming up soon ish. Tomorrow and Friday. Go Huskies. You guys go by Huskies or Lady Huskies? Huskies. Yeah, because we don't call the guys guy Huskies, you know, we just. You're just huskies. It's dogs, yeah. It's like your dogs. Okay. All right, any other announcements? Okay. Oh, my gosh, I got a clip for Chitty Chitty Bang Bang for you. That's random. Let's hope we get to that. That's random. It's one of the most <laughs> scary scenes from a childhood movie. It's like, hey, kids, let's watch Bambi's parents get shot. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you guys have ever, like, watched a ch children's program and he really came out of it traumatized. Oh, yeah. I mean, hello, yeah. It's like, what, is that the one where they take out the eyes? No, that's another one. That's Coraline, isn't it? Yeah. There was a cartoon that I watched when I was younger about spiders, and there was one specific character that was white, and they had, like, this really weird-shaped head that, like, it's a spider. They had, like, a really realistic face. Very impressionable. Yeah, very impressionable. Yeah, the, for, for me, actually, for my, for my younger sister, maybe more for the younger sisters, because, you know, when you're an older sibling and you find out that your younger siblings are afraid of things, I don't know. You're nicer later on in life, but, yeah. 
So yeah, the, the, the scene from Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, you guys know that story, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, when the child kidnapper comes around and tries to fool the children into thinking that he's like, you know, giving out candy and ice cream. Yeah, it's really, and, and, and here is like the British, like English children, shh, like to eat these little things called treacle tarts. I don't know what the heck is in a treacle tart. I still don't know for sure, but it's sweet. Anyway, so, and so this guy is like offering like can free candy, ice cream, and, and, and lollipops, and treacle tarts, and all free today. My little sister still has nightmares about that. So if I'm really trying to like, you know, be a big brother and not be nice, um, it'll be like, all free today. Yeah. Anyway, I'll show you that scene because it actually fits into what we're talking about here today. Got this? Write this down. The Germans lost. Boom. We got that. Okay. Right? The Germans lost. So did the Ottoman Empire. So did uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So did Bulgaria. Okay? We always forget Bulgaria was on the losing side. Did Italy lose? No, they switched in time. Okay? Okay? Okay. Italy switched in time. But make sure you write this down. Shh. And, and I've said this before. A lot of people didn't like the results of World War I, including some of the winners. Some of the facts that you, you, you had a lot of people die, and, and what was it for? Some countries were on the winning side, and they were like, we had a lot of people die, and we didn't get much from it, so they're dissatisfied. There are some. Let's go ahead and identify some people who were happy with the results of World War I. You ready? These are people most predominantly in Eastern Europe who got a country out of the war, okay? They got a country out of the war. And it was because the unique circumstances of three losers in the war, one of which was an ally. Russia lost, so did Germany, so did the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So let's go ahead and do these ones real quick. Um, because, and we'll get into a little bit more detail when we look at the Russian Civil War and how the communists are trying to take control over all of the old Russian Empire, but they're going to fail in certain regards. So write this down. New countries, Finland, from Russian territory, they will be able to establish themselves. So they can count their existence going back to the time of the end of World War I. Oh, look, here. Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. You're like, I know about the Baltic states. Finland. Oh, Estonia. What was the first one? Estonia. Estonia. Can, can you tell me the three colors for the Estonian flag? I mean, there's a trivia question. Blue. Yes. <laughs> and thank you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I got two juniors doing IAs on aspects having to do with Estonia. No, I mean, yeah, one of them about the sinking of the Estonia and like whether the investigations were really complete. And another is doing a comparison of choral influence versus rock influence in the music uh, leading up to these singing revolutions. It's really interesting. Yes and no. I mean, it's, that's the answer to every IA. Little of this, little of that, right? That's how we ask the question. We always ask a question in such a way that you get a little of this, little of that, right? If it starts going too much the one way, we change the question. We don't change the topic. <laughs> we change the question, okay? Which is good, you know, because that's the way it's supposed to be. All right, Poland, put that down. That's going to be very significant. Poland will be a new country. I won't say brand new country, but, I mean, Poland has existed in history, but just to remind yourselves, by the end of the 1700s, Russia and, at that time it was Prussia and Austria, had worked together to carve up Poland. It was really nasty. And so what happened to all the Polish people that were there? Well, they were still there. But they were now living under either Russian rule or German, Prussian rule or Austrian rule. Well, now, since all three of those have lost, boom, we get Poland back again. Okay? So Poland likes that because they come into existence there. Okay? So Germany does lose some land in that, uh, in that uh, equation. Austro-Hungarian Empire is pretty much broken up. I mean, make sure you write that down. They're pretty much broken up into different national ethnic regions. Okay? And they actually could have been broken up into even more. Austria remains as a country. That's the German-speaking one. Although, significantly, make sure you note this because we're going to come back to it, there are pockets of German speakers in other areas around there. So we'll see in our next unit, Germany will get Hitler. Hitler, I'm from Austria. They speak German. That should be part of Germany. 
So he's going to take over Austria. And then he's going to be like, well, we should take over this and this and this and this that has German speakers there. It's really weird. So Austria goes from being the, the base of a really big empire to ultimately, in the, in the end of the 1930s, being part of a German empire under, uh, uh, under Hitler. Okay? What are they today? They're a separate country. Hungary, separate country. Um, the Czechs and the Slovaks will get to buddy up together and be a united country together called Czechoslovakia. What are they today? They're, they're Czechia or something like that, or the Czech Republic, and then Slovakia. They decided to have a uh, happy little divorce sometime in the early 90s, and they're cool with that because most of the Czechs live over in the western part and the Slovaks live mostly in the eastern part. So that was an easy, that was an easy division. Um, Romania gets some new territory. They get to expand in the region known as Transylvania. Mm. So right there, Romania gets to expand a bit. Probably one of the biggest winners here is Serbia, right? The ones that helped start the whole war to begin with. They get to take on lots of territory, Slavic peoples. But if you look more closely, you're like, some of those peoples are not really that excited about being part of the same country with the Serbs. The new country will be called Yugoslavia. It will include original Serbia, but you'll have Slovenians in there and Croatians in there and Bosniaks in there, and you'll have Kosovars in there, Macedonians in there. We'll sort it all out later. But there you go, big country Yugoslavia. Uh, Bulgaria loses, so they lose little bits of territory to Yugoslavia. They lose a little bit here to Greece. Okay, here we go. Italy, they were on the winning side toward the end, and they did most of their fighting against Austria. So they will get some territory from Austria here and there, but there are going to be some folks in Italy that were like, no, that wasn't enough. Are you kidding me? We need to have more. Like, really? Is that going to be, like, part of the basis of, of Italy sort of, like, I don't know, sh shedding their, their democratic form of government and, and falling in with a, like, right-wing fascist dictator? Yep, the original one in the early 1920s. We'll get to that in the next unit. Anybody know his name? It is Mussolini. Benito. Yes, it is Mussolini. Yeah, before there was Hitler, there was Mussolini. Hitler was like, I want to be like Mussolini. And then when he became like Mussolini, he had his own country. He's like... I don't know. I don't really want to be that much like Mussolini. We'll get to World War II. Italy's going to be a bit of a drag. It's like Hitler's like, hey, Mussolini, go attack that, that, and that. Oh, my gosh, you can't get the job done. <laughs> get aside. I'll get the job done. Oh, is that delaying me? Yeah. Anyway. No, he, well, yeah, I mean, it switches when, it's, when he's dead, you know. But it's like, yeah, it's like inconsequential at that point. All right, so we got that. Oh, take a look here. Um, Denmark picks up a little bit of German territory, yeah. you know, a little border territory. And this is actually very important right here. Um, Alsace-Lorraine goes back to France, okay? And I think we already talked about how the limitation on the German military in the Rhineland, yes? Good. Okay, we got that. Good. Okay. All right, now, let's look at the Ottoman Empire. This is going to be important. We're going to spend a lot of time carving that up and figuring that up. And it's going to be really interesting because there's some long-term implications about what happens with the Ottoman Empire. Um, the Ottoman Empire, you know, used to go like all the way into Southeast Europe. They had lost that pretty much by the end of the 1800s with the new creation of all these different countries here. But the Ottoman Empire still had, obviously, Turkey and then all of these Arab areas to kind of its southeast. They had lost control of their North African possessions. You can write this down. The British, they had ostensible control over Egypt, right? I mean, there was an Egyptian government, but it was sort of like a lot of areas under the British things. Like, who's in charge of Australia? Britain. Who's in charge of New Zealand? Britain. Who's in charge of Canada? Eh? Britain. <laughs> it's like, who's going to declare war on behalf of Canada? Britain. Uh, who's in charge of South Africa? Britain. India. Britain. Egypt. Britain. Okay. So it's very interesting, and they, Egypt, excuse me, Egypt will be under ostensible control of the British even until like after World War II. My mom tells a story about how she was an actress, right? And so she participated during the war of entertaining British troops. She put on plays. She was in plays. She was in a group that did plays where the British troops were in Egypt and in the Palestinian region, which is going to, as well tell you, is going to come under the British control. It was fascinating because she tells a story about how, like in Egypt, a lot of the Egyptians were kind of like, 
really, Britain, you're here, we're not that excited about it. And so she was at a bus stop and there was a graffiti somebody had written, Britain, go home. And so here she was waiting for her bus, you know, this young English <laughs> like actress with this like anti-British like, you know, stuff written right behind her. And it's like, oh, it's just traffic advice, you know, <laughs> it's like, here's where you get the bus. <laughs> Oh, is, oh, that's really rude. That's really rude. Yeah, it's like, hello. Let, I mean, seriously, raise your hand if you were born in Idaho. Raise your hand if your ancestors go all the way back in Idaho history to the 1600s. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm like, who is a real native Idahoan? Idaho, I think Idaho's like, population has always consisted of about 40 to 50 percent or more of people who were born out of the state. Hello, that's who we are. <laughs> yeah. So get over it. Anyway, so yeah, yeah I mean, the, 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 yeah, so here, let's continue on. There were a lot of people, the Ottoman Empire, okay, how many of you guys, how many of you guys were born in California? My wife was born in California. Way to go. There we go. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh my gosh, chill out. All right, so the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire was still pretty big. Let me go to this. Um, we remember, was there still the Ottoman Empire at the end of the war? No. There had the Ottoman Empire had been overthrown in the sense, and so now we have a republic, and here is the founder of the republic, Ataturk. So we're like, woohoo, they got democracy. What is one downside? Uh, Evan, that we would say that we're like not really excited about this new government of Turkey because they're not really fully recognizing what actually took place there before that new government took place. Remember what I'm talking about? What terrible genocide had taken place under the Ottoman Empire that the new Turkish government was like, what? I don't see nothing. What was the name? What was the name? I'm pointing my arm at you. Armenians, exactly. They're Armenians. Armageddon. The Armenians. Armageddon. Armageddon. No, no, that's, that's later. Anyway, yeah, the Armenian genocide was during the time of that. Okay? So here's the deal. Okay, I'm going to point some stuff out on the map for you. A lot of detail here. You're like, oh my gosh, do we just have to pack this away? Like, this is going to make any difference to the history of the United States and where I live. It does. It does. This, this is the, what I'm going to tell you is going to fall into the general advice as, you know the people you form the most important relationships with in life? Yeah. You know, like, like, what? Okay. Well, yeah, yeah. But here's another thing. This is also fits into these know who, know the background of people around you, right? If you're going to enter into a relationship with somebody, it's important for you to know something about their background because there could be stuff in their background, like, do they have trust issues? That's important to know. Because if you're like, I mean, all of a sudden you're like, what the heck? I don't understand it. You're all mad at me because such a, you're suspecting me of such and such. It's like, I didn't do anything. And they're like, oh, it was that previous relationship, those previous things that didn't work out so well. So just know them, identify them, work with it, because we all have that, right? So here's the, here's the deal. Arabs have trust issues with Westerners. You can write that down. Arabs have trust issues with Westerners. And some of it goes right back to World War I. Here's the details. During World War I, the British and the French and the Russians are obviously fighting against the Westerners. Yeah, so Westerners meaning like British, French, I don't know, Americans. And we're like, what the heck? <laughs> you know, don't, it's not me. If you got a problem, it's with so-and-so. But you can't argue with that person about that. You just have to know it, be understanding, and work through it. All right? Because otherwise, you could end up having a lot of your own people dead. Where are you going with this? Let me, hear me out. Hear me out. So we got the Russians. Remember how the Russians were fighting against the Ottoman Turks? And who were the Russians trying to get to like <laughs> help them against the Ottoman Turks? Armenians, right? How'd that work out for the Armenians? Yeah, genocide. Okay? So the British, write this down, the British are going to make a real effort to get Arabs to join the fight against the Ottoman Turks. You got that? Yeah, it actually did. It worked pretty significantly. All right, and I'll tell you how. Here's what you need to know. First of all, the Ottoman Turkish Empire is run by the Turks. 
Turks are not Arabs. Turks predominantly live in what is now Turkey, so it actually helps you identify. Arabs, yes, hold on. Arabs live in many different places. If you were to go and say, where do Arabs live? Where do they speak Arabic? Where is there a concentration of Arab national ethnic identity? Arabia. Not just Arabia, but Iraq, not Iran, they're Persian, okay? Uh, Syria, Lebanon, even in Egypt. In fact, if you look over here, not at Cole, but all these different, various different flags and so forth, there is sort of like an Arab color scheme that they use when they're picking out their flag design. Let me see. We're going to go with red. I like green, white, and black. That's pretty much the, that's it. Actually, Cole, could you share what flag for what country kind of stands out as like, this one is not like the others? Israel, exactly. Make a little note of that. Israel, okay. Israel is a separate country. It is not predominantly Arabic, okay. And it is not predominantly, uh, what, what is the predominant religion of Israel today? Religion. The main religion in Israel today is Jewish. Okay? It's got the Star of David. Hello, if there's one thing you're going to learn this semester coming in, is that the Star of David is a sign of Jewish faith. They were forced to wear that by the Nazis in Germany. Okay? And if you took it off, if you were Jew and you took that off, you would be in big trouble. Although if you took it off and maybe hid, then maybe you could survive World War II. Anyway, so, we'll, we'll, so let's back this up here a little bit. So the British went to Arabs and said, hey, make sure you have this. I know you're Muslim, just like the Turks. They have that in common. And the British are not predominantly Muslim. Okay? I mean, there may be many things, but they're not predominantly Muslim. So the British are like, join with us to fight against the Turks. And the Arabs are going, and what's in it for us? <laughs> you can see, you know, you want us to join a fight against the Turks, and what's in it for us? What do you suppose might be in it for the Arabs? Territory, yeah. Their own countries. Right? You fight for us, you'll get independence. You'll get your territories. Um, there's a great film that was done in the 1960s called Lawrence of Arabia. It was about a British officer who was the point man on the British effort to go talk to the Arab countries and get them to join and actually fight against the uh, Turks. And there was, they actually got quite a bit done. So you can write that down. The movie's called Lawrence of Arabia. And the Arabs helped the British to defeat Turks in various different fights in that part of the war. Not Gallipoli, that was a whole other like, train wreck. And, but one of the things that Lawrence of Arabia was upset about in fact, it was fascinating because as the war went on, he became more Arab. You're like, what do you mean he became more Arab? He dressed like an Arab. Right? He started, he's like, I'm not going to dress like a British officer and so forth. I can be much more persuasive and work very well with these Arabs if I dress like an Arab. And so he did. But he was disappointed. Write this down. The British kept part of the promise, not all of it. Question. I wouldn't be surprised. He, I mean, he got a major motion picture made about him and so forth. And it's kind of tragic because at the end, he's disappointed. Why is he disappointed? Because it almost looks like he got played. And the Arabs feel like they got played. All right? Let's identify first Arabs that were satisfied with the result. They got land. They got their independent countries. Okay, you ready? You can't really see it quite, quite right here. But there's a little Arab country that was created, and they're sitting on a whole bunch of oil. And it's really a sweet deal. Kuwait, very good. K-U-W-A-I-T. They like it, okay? Saudi Arabia is going to be created, recognized, expanded, so they're happy, okay? Basically, if you look at the Arabian Peninsula, most, that's where you're going to get the most satisfaction. Yemen, Oman, the Persian Gulf states like uh, United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Bahrain, those guys are going to be satisfied. They're going to get like countries and so forth, all right? So there we go, satisfaction. <laughs> Guarantee. Well, for you guys. Not everybody gets it, though. This land, take a look at the map. This is where this map is helpful. The land you see that's sort of like orange and then sort of a pinkish color here, that's going to be taken away from the Ottoman Empire. You right? Write that down. So Ottoman Empire will lose that land, and where's it going to go? 
It goes to the, well, officially, it goes to the League of Nations. Oh, that international group that was just created. The League of Nations. And the League of Nations will be responsible for that land on paper. But who actually is going to take control and govern that land as a League of Nations, make sure you get this word down, mandate, M-A-N-D-A-T-E. It's like, Britain and France are going to be in control of that land as a looking after it. Until when? Until sometime in the future. When they can be independent. Right. Sometime in the future when they can be independent. Can I see a timeline on like when they're going to actually gain their independence? Let me see. We go through the 1920s. Have got their independence yet? No. What about the 1930s? No. When are they going to get their independence? After World War II. So this is where you get this. So you get a lot of Arab people. They're like, we were promised that we're going to get our independence, and that promise was delayed. And so they're not too happy about that. In their minds, it looks like Britain and France have expanded their empire. Got it? All right, let's be specific as far as who gets what. Iraq, Transjordan, which ultimately will become Jordan, and then Palestine which most of which ultimately will become Israel. Britain has got that. You got that? Make sure you have that. Iraq, Transjordan, Palestine will be under British control. Syria and Lebanon will be under French control. Okay? And already, after the war, you get people in those areas going, we want to be independent, we want to be independent. And ultimately, they will. But in the meantime, they're pretty mad about it. Okay? And in fact, Let's move, let's move the clock up a little bit <laughs> to just about before you guys were born. 2003, the United States of America was getting indications based on what ultimately turned out to be not completely 100% reliable information, but anyway, it was important information that the leader of Iraq, Saddam Hussein, was developing weapons of mass destruction and could use them against the United States of America because we'd fought him before during the, uh, uh, the Persian Gulf War, the war in, in, in Kuwait. You'll get to that, <laughs> you'll get to that later. But it's like, so we're like, oh, man. So in 2003, George W. Bush goes to Congress and says, could I get a resolution supporting uh, me in an effort to overthrow the Saddam Hussein government? And he did, and we did. We overthrew the Saddam Hussein government. So we moved in. We had U.S. troops in pretty much all of um, Iraq. And we're like, okay, we got rid of Saddam Hussein. Everything's cool. Everything's great. That was fast. And then, what? <laughs> totally separate thing. Don't complicate it. We're just talking about Iraq right now. It gets very complicated when you're talking about Iran. Anyway, it, it requires a whole separate, like, thing to go through all of the different... But here's the deal. We got U.S. troops there in 2003, and all of a sudden, we got Iraqis fighting against us. We're like, what are you fighting against us for? We came in here to help you get rid of your really bad dictator guy and then help you to set up your own government. But that's a complicated thing to help you to set up your own government. And we're going to keep our troops here until things are stabilized enough so that that can happen and so forth. A lot of Iraqis are going, I don't trust you. I don't trust you. You say you're bringing your troops in here, and you say you're only in charge for a very short period of time until we can, like, set up our own government and so forth. But I don't trust you. We've got trust issues. And so most of the men and women that, that ha suffered uh, losses and casualties and so forth was in the fighting in Iraq after we overthrew Saddam Hussein. And eventually we were able to persuade folks, and so we were able to get out of Iraq mostly later on down the line. Okay? And people are like, why are they attacking us? Well, let me give you a history lesson. <laughs> Let's go back to some trust issues that the Iraqi people have. Okay? Here's another group of people. Write this down. They're called the Kurds. You're like, I don't see them on the map. <laughs> if they don't have a country, they're, they're not there. It's kind of like, where were the Poles before Poland was created at the end of World War I? They were there. Right? If you have Polish ancestry, and you look back, and you're like, well, my great-great-grandpa was born in, oh, this is weird, Prussia, or Russia, or Austria. <laughs> but he's Polish. Yes, that's because the Polish area was under the control of outsiders. Kurds, write this down. Kurds live in sort of the northern Iraq region, the northeast part of Syria, 
and what is kind of the southeast part of Turkey. You're like, do they, are they going to get their own country? They wanted their own country. They sent delegates to the Paris Peace Conference. They're like, hey, can we have our own country? And Britain and France and the others are like, I don't know, we're trying to help out this new Turkish Republic thing, and they don't want, and I don't know, something about Armenians and, uh, and the Syrians and the Greeks, and they just want their whole thing to be in charge and so forth. So Kurds, the Kurds were told, no, you cannot have your own country. And you're like, well, who are these people? They're Muslim. Are they Arabic? No. Are they Turkish? No. Well, what ethnicity, nationality are they? They're Kurds. <laughs> Hello, they're Kurds. And they're going to have a real hard time in Turkey and northern Iraq. In fact, a lot of them were killed in northern Iraq under Saddam Hussein. Who's their best friend sometimes? America. America. Except when, you know, it's kind of like who was at the point fighting against uh, uh, ISIS, the really nasty extreme Islamic terrorist in that part of the world? The Kurds. They were right up there fighting and so forth. And when the fighting was pretty much over and the Turks were like, okay, now we're going to like beat on the Kurds some more. The Kurds are like, little help, America, can you help us? Anyway, it's tragic. Oh, let's speak of other tragedies. Palestine, okay? Who are most of the people living in Palestine at the time that it becomes a mandate? Arabs. But, significantly, write this down, in Palestine, a significant number of people were moving there from Europe. These people are like, we're getting a sense that we're not really appreciated here in Europe very much. There's a lot of really strong anti-Semitic feeling in Europe. <laughs> Jews. They start moving there during the time of the British occupation mandate of Palestine. And they continue moving there if they survive World War II and the Holocaust in Europe. They're like, oh my gosh, can we, <laughs> we'd like to establish like a Jewish state. Will they ultimately get their way after World War II? Yes. Is it going to be a really fun, peaceful, everybody like kumbaya, slap on the back neighborhood? No, I mean, you get a little bit of a sense just by looking at the flag orientation here. Israel, little Jewish state, is surrounded by lots and lots of Arabs, okay? It's a complicated story because ultimately some of the biggest losers in that whole thing are going to be Palestinian Arabs led by me. No, that's not me. That is, that is not me. That is Mohammed uh, Abbas, uh, excuse me, uh, Hassan Ali Mohammed, also known as Abbas. He's the head of of the Palestinian group that's been trying to get some autonomy in the midst of Israel. It's complicated, but it's not me, okay? It's not me. My dad picked that poster up for me when he went to be an election observer for one of the elections of the Palestine. It is! Hey, you know, I can't do everything. I can stop the Cold War, you know, but I can't, you know, do everything. You know, anyway, yeah. Oh, and, um, <clears throat> Germany, this, is, this part's easy. Germany loses all of its African possessions. Okay, we'll do this fairly quickly. Germany loses its colonial stuff. All that stuff that Wilhelm II is like, I want an empire. <laughs> They're going to lose their whole empire. And will they become independent? No. There are a lot of Africans that are starting to feel during, by the end of World War I, maybe we should be independent. Maybe we should be independent. When are they going to get their independence? After World War II. But if you're in South German, Southwest Africa, it's going to be handed over to South Africa. German East Africa is going to be handed over mostly to the British. It goes from being Tanganyika to Tanzania. Although there's a little bit of tiny area there. It's like we're going to spend a lot of time focusing on this little tiny area in like the German Northwest part. I mean, eventually they're going to be handed over to the Belgians because the Belgians have got the Congo. I mean, it's two little areas. Uh, Burundi and Rwanda I means we're spending a lot of time talking about them. Yeah, senior year you will because it's going to be another round of genocide. Fast action genocide. A lot of people killed in the space of just six or eight weeks. Um, Cameroon and Togo are going to be handed over to the French because the French have so much uh, territory in West Africa already. Why not? Here's the Pacific. Uh, the Japanese are going to do pretty well here. The Japanese, they're on the right side, the winning side. They get the Mariana Islands, the Palau Islands, the Caroline Islands, and the Marshall Islands. Woohoo! That was smart, Japan. You're on the winning side. You get a whole bunch of the German territories in the Pacific. And we'll see, they're expanding. Uh, New Zealand gets Samoa. Australia gets New, New Guinea, which eventually will be part of a new country called Papua New Guinea. Oh, and then this. Oh. Oh, no. Yes, it's a man. 
It's a man with boobs. This is an anti-Jewish cartoon. And it's, it's an anti-Jewish cartoon. They're saying, this is a man, and you can't trust him because they stabbed the Germans in the back. It was the Jews that caused the Germans to lose World War II. You can tell this is a Jew because of the boobs, because of this, and because of the big nose. And so next time, I will cue it up. <laughs> oh, my gosh. An anti-Jewish physical stereotype, the child catcher. For Roll doll? The author of Chitty Chitty Bang Bang also wrote Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, James and the Giant Peach, and on close examination, he really was an anti-Semite. Yeah. And like his most memorable, really nasty characters, have long-standing traditional anti-Jewish thing, like the big nose. If you haven't seen this before, it will frighten you. So 48 hours from now, we'll see the guy going around trying to capture children and put them in long-term confinement by lying to them about lollipops and ice cream and treacle tots. No, I mean, it's kind of like, yeah, just because, yeah, and it's like some of the best, the To Kill a Mockingbird, I mean, that's a great book, anti, you know, racism and so forth, and yet, <laughs> yeah, don't read the sequel. Yeah, the book that, that um, Harper Lee wrote, Later, it just ultimately was discovered and found out. The great hero in To Kill a Mockingbird, later in his life, becomes all cynical and everything and kind of reverts to racism. It's kind of like, oh, no, I want my heroes to be heroic, <laughs> not, not mixed. So anyway, we'll come back to that. Okay. And You got your little uh, cameo at the very end. 